you know, uh, I knew Herbie, and uh, I don't call him Herbert Mullen, and of course I don't call myself Edmund Amo Kemper III either. A lot of pain inside, he had a lot of anguish inside, he had a lot of hate inside, and it was addressed at people he didn't even know because he didn't dare do anything to the people he knew, because he was aware of all of the structure around that, and that that would be the end of his life. I know what happened. Herbie, don't give me that bullshit about earthquakes and don't give me that crap about uh, God was telling you. I said, you couldn't even be talking to me now if God was talking to you because of the pressure I'm putting on you right now, these little shocking insights into what you did. God would start talking to you right now if you were really that kind of ill. Today we will be unraveling the twisted and shocking events that occurred in Santa Cruz, California between October 1927 and January 1973 at the hands of one man who believed he was commanded to murder. If you asked the police, he was a whacked out druggie with legalized acid tattooed on his belly. His lawyers argued that he was a deluded, paranoid schizophrenic. And if you ask serial killer Edmund Kemper, who terrorized Santa Cruz in the same time frame, Irby was just a cold-blooded killer, killing everyone he saw for no good reason. However, to hear it from Herb's side of the story, he believes himself to be a hero, a sacrificial scapegoat who killed his consenting victims to save California from a cataclysmic earthquake. This is the story of Herbert Mullen. Herbert William Mullen was born April 18, 1947, a date which held great significance for him later in life. April 18th was the anniversary of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. It was also the anniversary of Albert Einstein's death. Both of these events would, in Herb's twisted mind, give him a cosmic duty to kill. As a child, Herbert Mullen was described as bright and gentle-natured. Not long before his fifth birthday, the Mullins moved from a small farming community near Salinas, California to San Francisco, where his father, Martin William Mullen, worked as a furniture salesman. Herb and his older sister attended a private religious school. By all accounts, the Mullins were a well-adjusted and educated family. Bill Mullen had been a military hero in World War II, and he was considered a stern but never abusive father. He was proud of his service and relayed war stories to his son, and even taught him how to use a gun. Sometimes, the elder Mullen would playfully box with his young son in the kitchen before dinner. Herb would later interpret these matches as a deadly challenge by his sadistic father. According to the adult Herb, his entire childhood was destroyed by a conspiracy led by his parents. He saw his parents as killjoy reincarnationalists who believed that by spoiling the enjoyment of others, they improved their birth position in the next life. Herb later testified that he believed his father threatened to kill anyone who would play with Herb, and even went door to door asking that everyone ignore his son. He even believed the communion services at his school were diabolical. He said, When I was in the second grade, they told me that Jesus Christ, the person, actually lives in the Holy Eucharist. It is a lie designed to induce naivete and gullibility in young children, thereby making them susceptible to receive and carry out telepathic, subconscious suicide orders. But this is schizophrenic hindsight. At the time, Herb seemed happy. When he was halfway through high school, the Mullins moved to Felton, a small town among the majestic redwoods in Santa Cruz County. Despite being uprooted at a vulnerable age, Herb made plenty of friends in high school and was envied as one of the popular crowd. He played varsity football, had a steady girlfriend, and was voted most likely to succeed. Quite a macabre prophecy considering that Herb would become Santa Cruz County's most prolific serial killer. After graduating in 1965, Herb went to Cabrillo College to study engineering. He even considered joining the army. Everything was going great, but then paranoid schizophrenia changed all of that. The incident that stands out as the trigger to the start of Herb's deteriorating sanity was the tragic death of his best friend, Dean Richardson, who was killed in a car accident the summer after high school graduation. Herb was devastated and fell into a state of macabre despair, building shrines in his room to Dean where he spent hours alone. He wondered if Dean's death was some sort of cosmic sacrifice and became obsessed with the idea of reincarnation. Although raised as a Catholic, Herb began to fervently study Eastern religions looking for answers, answers to the tragedy of a lost friend, and answers to the voices that were suddenly haunting his thoughts. He changed his major from engineering to philosophy at the state college he attended, but dropped out after a few weeks. 
In the spring of 1966, he ran into a friend of Dean's at the beach named Jim Genera. Genera gave him some pot and told him about the anti-war movement. Mullen later said that Genera spearheaded a movement to befuddle and confuse me, and that the pot Genera gave him damaged his brain. He said, if Genera had given me some Benzedrine instead, I would have become an artist. Soon after, he began to alienate his longtime girlfriend with his sudden involvement in hallucinogenic drugs. He talked about an impending California earthquake and moving to Canada to avoid it. His weird glares and bizarre ramblings gave her the creeps, and he was becoming violent. Not long after, the relationship was over. On the surface, Herb's rebellious activities were typical of the times. He experimented with drugs and horrified his military-bred father by declaring himself a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. He even announced that he was going to India to study yoga, but his behavior soon escalated from weird to alarming. One night in 1969, while visiting his sister, he mimicked his brother-in-law's every gesture and word. This is called echolalia and echopraxia, symptomatic of schizophrenia. His sister later described it, When my husband would eat, Herb would eat. Whatever my husband would do, Herb would do. And that went on for hours. Then he just sat and stared at us. The next day, his family took him to a mental hospital where he voluntarily committed himself, but he was soon out on his own. Herb later asked his sister to have sex with him, and when she declined, he asked if his brother-in-law would sleep with him instead. The whole family grimly worried for his safety, as well as their own. Because he had been so normal as a child, the Mullins thought that Herb's suddenly scary behavior was drug-induced. After all, it was Santa Cruz in the late 1960s. Marijuana farms and acid labs flourished in the nooks of the Loma Prieta Mountains. Counterculture blossomed in the laid-back beach town where hippies lived off the land, women hitchhiked, and drugs were easily accessible. Even fifth graders were selling pills at school, according to the local papers. It wasn't a stretch to think Herb was on drugs. Legalized acid was tattooed on his belly. Although he dabbled in acid and pot use, he did not indulge more than his peers. But mixing recreational drugs with mental illness is a concoction for psychosis. Schizophrenia is a hideous mental illness which can devastate the life of a promising young adult. Typically, symptoms flare up in the late teens to early 20s, including hearing voices, an intense paranoia of others, and delusional thinking. After his release from the Mendocino State Hospital in 1969, Herb took a dishwashing job in South Lake Tahoe, but soon quit. He returned to Santa Cruz, where a ranger found him sitting cross-legged in a trance-like state, as if meditating. When the ranger asked him to leave, Mullen continued to stare straight ahead, but slowly reached for a hunting knife by his side. The ranger caught him before he grabbed the knife and took him to jail, but he was soon released. Back out on the streets, Mullen drifted down to San Luis Obispo and told his roommate that he had been receiving messages which were telling him to do things. After meditating, he ritualistically burned the end of his penis with a lit cigarette and later made an aggressive pass at his male friend, whose uncle was a psychiatric doctor. Mullen was promptly committed to a psychiatric hospital. As a result of mental disorder, said person is a danger to others, a danger to himself, and gravely disabled. In 1970, he met an older woman and flew to Hawaii with her, but within days he was back in the psychiatric ward. He preached yoga, non-violence, and left the premises to look for a job while wearing his hospital gown. When his parents paid for his flight home, he scared them so much with his psychotic rantings that they pulled off the road to call the police. Herb was taken into custody, but soon released and returned to Santa Cruz. His sanity continued to deteriorate, and his behavior grew increasingly erratic. He blazed through fads as if trying to secure an identity and peace of mind. He shaved his head, went on a macrobiotic diet, and rapidly lost weight. Later, he wore a big black sombrero and faked a Mexican accent, then became a boxer. Although he preached anti-violence, he smashed a hatchet against a fireplace when an Asian woman ignored his suggestion that they have a biracial child together. Mullen swung from counterculture to ultra-conservative, while in court for bizarre behavior on the streets, he demanded that the judge legalize LSD and marijuana, yet he later despised hippies and flower children. After being a conscientious objector, he tried to join the Marines. Herb wasn't just bisexual as he insisted in court, or biracial as he pretended to be, he was bi-everything. Bi-political, bi-spiritual, bi-cultural. Herb knew there was something wrong. He obsessed over his life, trying to figure out what went wrong and who sabotaged his mind. He blamed his father for being too sexually uptight and later accused him of being a mass murderer who commanded him to kill by telepathy. 
He blamed the drugs he took for messing up his brain and targeted the drug dealers. He blamed the hippies for brainwashing him into being a conscientious objector. He tried drug treatment centers, he tried outpatient clinics for the mentally ill, but didn't stick with anything. He later even tried Bible study meetings, but made everyone uneasy when he declared, Satan gets into people and makes them do things they don't want to. In May 1971, when Herb was 24, he moved to San Francisco, away from the watchful eye of his family. Donald Lund, a psychiatrist who examined Mullen, believes that this was a critical period in Herb's psychosis. During this time, he lived in decrepit apartments among alcoholics and drug addicts, sinking further into his bizarre belief systems. Mullen also became briefly interested in boxing, even signing up for a Golden Gloves tournament. However, at this tournament, he wouldn't stop assailing his opponent. Trainers even had to pull him away. Afterwards, he punched a speed bag until his knuckles were covered in blood. Then, when left unattended, he stood still and loudly chattered with himself. After losing his first match in the ring, Mullen left the boxing ring with the plans to become a priest. Mullen also dabbled in art. However, after punching the floors of his apartment one day and getting into screaming matches with God, the apartment manager evicted him. One of his artist friends would go on to say, he left the human race that day. In September of 1972, Mullen moved back in with his parents, determined to make something of himself. But he stopped taking his medication, and he festered in his anger at his father while living under his roof. And to top it all off, a major earthquake was predicted to devastate California in the next few months. Although the eccentric, self-taught scientist who grimly announced the trembler wasn't taken seriously by most, there was one person who took it as a call to action. Where most people saw a crackpot, Mullen saw a prophet. On a wet October morning, Friday the 13th, Herbert Mullen found a baseball bat in the garage and went for a drive. Earlier in the week, he claimed that his father had been sending him telepathic messages to kill. If I didn't kill, it would bring shame to the family by showing cowardice, he said. It was kill or get out. As he drove along the windy road that followed the river through the redwoods, Mullen spotted a transient walking alone. After he passed him, he pulled over, popped the hood of his 58 Chevy station wagon, and pretended to be having car trouble. When the homeless man, Lawrence White, stopped to take a look at the engine, Mullen bashed his head with the baseball bat. He then pushed the lifeless body of the would-be good Samaritan down the side of the road and drove off. Then, Mullen said, the ball was rolling. White was an easy target and wasn't missed. Between stints in the drunk tank, the 55-year-old transient slept under bridges and in the woods where he wouldn't be hassled. He was a blank, barely mentioned in the papers when his battered body was discovered days later. No family came to his funeral, and no one rushed out to find his killer. Mullen later claimed that White looked like Jonah from the Bible and sent him telepathic messages. Hey man, pick me up and throw me over the boat. Kill me so that others will be saved. After reading Irving Stone's biography on Michelangelo, The Agony and the Ecstasy, Mullen decided that, as a serious artist, he should do what the famous Renaissance sculptor did, dissect a body. Michelangelo spent hours and hours secretly dissecting bodies so he could find out about the form of the human body for his painting and sculpture and stuff. That's why his works are so much better than anyone else's. It gave him insight others didn't have. His mom had given him the Michelangelo book, hoping that Herb would be inspired to use art as an emotional outlet. Yet what it inspired was another murder, and the most grisly one in Mullen's career. In a rare twist of maternal wrath, Herb blamed his mother for this killing, believing that she gave him the book as a hint to dissect someone. I think she was trying to tell me what to do, so I could have this insight too. Mary Guilfoyle would be the target of this brutal attack. One day, when Mary was running late for a job interview, she did what many young women in Santa Cruz did, despite the warnings, she hitched a ride. No doubt the 24-year-old Guilfoyle had heard the cautionary tales about women last seen hitchhiking who were missing, or assaulted, or found decapitated, but the slight, doe-eyed young man behind the wheel didn't look like a brute. He was handsome, soft-spoken, and not much bigger than her. With Guilfoyle relaxed in the car, Mullen pulled off onto a quiet side street, yanked out a hunting knife, and stabbed her in the chest and back. Guilfoyle died instantly, but she would not be found for months. After dragging her body into a deserted area off the hillside road, Mullen opened Guilfoyle up and unraveled her organs. Mullen thought he could see inside people's heads, but now he wanted to see inside their bodies. Whatever it was he saw, it was enough to dissuade him from recommitting this grotesque and morbid autopsy again. If voices were commanding him to kill, he was overextending into fetishistic savagery. On November 2nd, All Souls Day, one of the holiest of Catholic celebrations, Mullen stumbled into a church in Los Gatos, just over the hills from Santa Cruz. 
he had been drinking and decided to go to St. Mary's Catholic Church to give me strength to never attempt to kill again. Mullen thought the church was empty, but when he heard Father Henry Tomei in one of the booths, he decided, well, if you are in here, I guess I should kill you. He tried to force the confessional door open. Tomei, hearing the commotion, opens the door to see what was going on. Mullen attacked Tomei with a hunting knife, stabbing him in the heart as he struggled, trapped in the confines of his narrow confessional. A parishioner walked in and, seeing the struggle, screamed and ran out. She got a glimpse of a young man dressed in black, struggling with the priest. It must have been a blur of black and blood. The community was outraged by the senseless murder of 65-year-old Tomei, a hero in the French resistance movement in World War II. Some worried that it was the work of a satanic cult. Civic leaders attended his funeral, and so did the police, hoping to catch a glimpse of the man dressed in black, but Mullen did not return. He did, however, leave fingerprints at the crime scene. That Mullen's third victim would be a Catholic priest fits with his fleeting malice towards organized religion. Religion was fine with Mullen as long as it was his own bizarre concoction. In 1970, he disrupted a Sunday morning service in a Catholic church, telling the startled congregation that what you are doing is wrong. Mullen then offered his own philosophy as an alternative before being physically tossed out. Yet Mullen's rebellion against religion often flipped into a full embrace of Catholicism. He would carry a Bible around and talked about becoming a priest. His mother even once said he'd been a deeply religious child, an altar boy in the Catholic religion. By killing Father Tomei, Mullen seemed to have struck close to the source of his anger, his own stern Roman Catholic father. Father Tomei's murder agitated him more than any of his other victims, according to psychiatrist Donald Lund. In his typical pattern of kill and make up, Mullen now wanted to appease his father and tried to follow in his footsteps by joining the armed forces. The military seemed like the ideal solution. Mullen could indulge his violent urges with the blessings of the state. In November, he applied to join the Coast Guard. When he was denied in December after failing the psychological exam, he lapsed into his paranoia that it was all a conspiracy against him. He believed the hippies and war resistors were to blame. They brainwashed him by giving him drugs and talked him into being a conscientious objector. Now the voices were back, urging a sacrifice, and this time he was going after the people who ruined his life. The peace advocates and flower children had played tricks on my mind, and I had to reap vengeance, he told Dr. Lund. He turned his sights to a longtime friend and fellow drug user, John Hooper, bringing a hunting knife to his house, but there were nine other people there. Mullen realized it was time to upgrade his killing method, and went and bought a gun. At the gun shop, he gave his occupation as a sketch artist lying about his stints in the psychiatric wards. But for some reason, Mullen decided to hold off on killing the flower children. Instead, he applied to the Marine Corps. The recruiting sergeant was reluctant, but after Mullen's badgering, he recommended him for service. He wrote in his official report, Herbert William Mullen is an intelligent and highly motivated young man, with an ultra-zealous eagerness to enlist in the USMC. Because of Herb's earnest desire to improve his lot and climb above his peers, as it were, I submit that Herbert William Mullen can and most likely will be a benefit to whatever unit he is assigned and a credit to his corps. Mullen was tremendously excited that his application had been accepted. He now had a purposeful mission. On January 15, 1973, Mullen passed both the physical and psychiatric exams for the Marines, but when he stubbornly refused to sign a document acknowledging his arrest record, he was dismissed. He was devastated, bitterly denouncing his parents for their failures in raising him, but they had had enough of Herb's ranting, and told him it was time to move out. On January 19th, Mullen found a shabby apartment near the beach, where he sat alone, his resentment festering, and the kill voices filling his brain. He decided to kill the most important peace advocate, Jim Genera, his high school buddy. In Mullen's distorted logic, Jim Genera represented everything that messed up his life. Genera gave him the drugs that caused his brain to malfunction. Genera told him about the peace movement which made all of society shun him, and he even tricked him out of buying land. Mullen, alone and fuming in his disappointments, decided that Genera had duped him. On January 25, 1973, Mullen drove to a shanty area hidden away on a muddy road near the Mystery Spot, a popular Santa Cruz tourist trap in the mountains. Soaked by the rain, he waited for Kathy Francis to come to the door of the wooden shack she shared with her husband Bob and her two children, 9-year-old David and 4-year-old Damon. When Mullen asked to see Jim, Kathy told him that Jim and his wife Joan moved to Western Avenue in town. Mullen thanked her and left, but he would be back. He arrived to Jim's home on Western Avenue, and when Genera let the casual acquaintance into his home, Mullen opened fire, shooting Jim Genera. Wounded, Jim dragged himself upstairs where his wife was taking a bath. Mullen followed him up the stairs and shot them both in the head. With his hunting knife, he stabbed both of the Generas to the point of overkill. 
The Gennaros would be discovered later that day by Joan's mother who was babysitting their infant girl. The decision to go back to Mystery Spot Road and kill Kathy Francis and her two boys was the most logical of Mullen's otherwise unfathomable killings. Francis was a potential witness, and Mullen was terrified of jail. He drove back to the Francis home, parked his station wagon down the road so it wouldn't get stuck in the mud, shoved the cabin door open, and opened fire. He shot Kathy in the chest and head, and killed the two boys as they played Chinese checkers on their bunk bed. In his rage, he stabbed all three, even though they were obviously dead. The massacre looked like a drug burn to the local authorities. Both Bob Francis and Jim Genera were known marijuana dealers. After Bob Francis was found and cleared as a suspect, the police asked him if he had any idea who would have committed these heinous murders. Bob produced a long list of drug dealers, rivals, and other misfits, but Herb Mullen was not on the list. In fact, the last time Jim Genera had seen Mullen was in the summer of 1971, when Mullen did 10 hits of acid during a visit. A few months later, Mullen sent Genera a weird letter, asking him who he was going to vote for in the upcoming November election. Bob Francis and Jim Genera laughed at it and didn't give Mullen much thought after that. In Henry Cowell State Park, located near Felton, California, eight miles north of Santa Cruz, the Card Brothers built a temporary campsite out of plastic sheets and spare wood, far from the Rangers' route. They chose a spot called the Garden of Eden, and on February 10th, the four teenagers who lived in it were about to be permanently expelled. Mullen discovered the illegal campsite when he was wandering around in the woods. The four boys, Brian Scott Carr, David Olicar, Robert Spector, and Mark Drebelbis, invited him in, but Mullen was hostile. He demanded that the boys pack up and leave, because they were defacing government property. Mullen was angry that he had been hassled by a ranger for doing the same thing a while earlier, and didn't think it was fair that these teenagers should get away with it. The boys looked at the scowling Mullen, comic in his intent to enforce the law, and laughed at him. As they argued, Mullen said, I decided to kill them, and asked them telepathically if I could, and they all answered yes. They were all in a sitting position, and it was all over in a few seconds. Later, Mullen would say that they asked for it. He meant it literally, but prosecutors took it as a proof of his hatred for renegade campers, hippies, flower children, and other counterculture deviants. Had he ever really asked for the victim's permission, it's likely he would not have had many takers. The scene of carnage in the woods, discovered a week later by the brother of one of the victims, revealed a desperate struggle that lasts for more than a humane few seconds. One of the teenagers was shot trying to claw his way through the plastic walls. They were trapped, and Mullen viciously shot them one by one. When Mullen was finished, he took their rifle and $20. On February 12th, trap shooters found Mary Guilfoyle's remains. Again, police warned against the danger of hitchhiking and implored young women to stay out of the cars of strangers. It's like Russian roulette, they said, but this warning carried little weight with the victim Mullen would hit tomorrow. Who would have known that pottering in your front yard at 8 in the morning could be deadly? On February 13th, Mullen planned to bring some firewood to his parents' home. But according to him, a telepathic message came in from his father. Don't deliver a stick of wood until you kill somebody. The voice suggested Uncle Enos, but when Herb resisted, the voice wasn't as particular. Just kill somebody, anybody. Mullen was driving down the road when he noticed a 72-year-old retired prizefighter and fishmonger named Fred Abbey Perez working in his garden in Santa Cruz. Mullen did a U-turn, came back down the street, stopped, put the rifle across the hood of his car, and shot him once in the heart. He died instantly. Mullen sat quietly in his car for a moment, holding the rifle he took from the campsite a few days ago. Then he backed up and drove away slowly. If, for Mullen, the young campers represented his own flower child phase that he now wanted to wipe away, his 13th victim, Perez, oddly enough, represented someone who Mullen wanted to be. He was someone I respected, Mullen said, although he didn't know him. He had no explanation for why he shot Perez. The prosecution would later argue that it was a come-catch-me crime that Mullen was ready to call it quits. And this time, there was a witness. A neighbor heard the shot, and peering out her window, caught a glimpse of the killer's vehicle and license plate. Mullen was headed toward Felton, his Chevy station wagon filled with firewood for his parents, the rifle from the campsite in the front seat covered by a paper bag. A lone policeman pulled him over without backup and arrested him. Mullen did not resist, but he wouldn't speak either. At the police station, Mullen sulked and refused to talk. Even routine questions such as, do you have an attorney, or would you like to make a phone call, met with Mullen's loud reply of silence. He continued to chant the word silence until everyone had had enough. Frustrated investigators ordered him to his cell. 
As they took him away, Mullen announced, You people were responsible for the three million killed in World War II. The doctor at the police station who examined Mullen was surprised by his tattoos, which read, Legalize Acid and Eagleize Marijuana. Other tattoos reading Birth, Mahasamadhi, and Kriya Yoga. Strange tattoos for someone who appeared so clean-cut and hated hippies with a passion. At his sparse apartment where Mullen had lived for the last three weeks, police found a Bible, the paperback book Einstein, The Life and Times, an address book with genera listed, and newspaper articles about the recent murders. The revolver had been discovered in his station wagon, and ballistic tests were soon underway. They also found the following note. Let it be known to the nations of Earth and the people that inhabit it, this document carries more power than any other written before. Such a tragedy as what has happened should not have happened, and because of this action which I take of my own free will, I am making it possible to occur again. For while I can be here, I must guide and protect my dynasty. Like the thick morning fog, speculation rolled through the Santa Cruz Valley. Was this diminutive young man the same guy who was beheading hitchhikers? The day following his arrest, officials announced that ballistics proved that Mullen had also killed the Francis family as well as the Generas. Those who knew the 25-year-old Mullen remembered him as bright, deeply religious, but somewhat uptight. But he had fallen into heavy drug use and blew his mind. Mullen was initially charged with six counts of murder. The count rose to ten after the bodies of the campers were discovered two days later on February 17th. Bodies seemed to be turning up on a daily basis, but now that they had a suspect in custody, Santa Cruz authorities looked at the recent unsolved murders, hoping to tie them to Mullen. Investigators compared Mary Guilfoyle's skeleton with the remains of the other women found. Los Gatos authorities submitted the fingerprints found at the church where Father Tomé was stabbed to death. Reporters clamored to know if it was the same killer. District Attorney Peter Chang, with some resignation, said, We must be the murder capital of the world right now. When asked why the murder rate in Santa Cruz was so high, Chang said, First, we've had a homicidal maniac whom we know has killed ten people. After a reporter asked about the additional five bodies of female hitchhikers, Chang grimly responded, We then have another homicidal maniac, referring to none other but Edmund Kemper, who terrorized Santa Cruz within the same time period. As much as they would have liked to tie all the murders to Herb Mullen, there was no evidence that linked him to the murdered co-eds. The skillfulness of the decapitations of two women found on February 15th, the same day as Mullen's arraignment, convinced investigators that another killer was working the area. Mullen was charged with 10 counts of murder, as he had not yet been charged with killing Lawrence White, Father Henry Tomei, or Mary Guilfoyle, his first three victims. At his hearing on March 1st, Mullen carried in a two-volume legal book and startled the court by admitting to all of the crimes and pleading guilty. However, the judge seriously doubted Mullen's competence to stand trial. Therefore, the trial focused on whether or not he was legally sane, which under U.S. law means that he understood the nature and quality of his actions and understood right from wrong. Psychiatrists were called in to examine Mullen. It was unanimous. Herbert William Mullen was a paranoid schizophrenic. Typically, schizophrenics suffer from auditory hallucinations, hearing voices, fragmented thinking, and delusional belief systems of self-importance, including being psychic. Despite rational evidence proving otherwise, a schizophrenic will be convinced that there is a grand conspiracy against them. Mullen's extensive hospital records, along with his one-on-one -on -one examinations with the doctors, convinced everyone that he was seriously mentally ill. Everyone agreed that Mullen killed at least ten people. The trial would determine whether or not he was legally sane when he did it. Legally speaking, insanity is determined by the McNaughton Standard, which says that if a defendant understood the difference between right and wrong, then the defendant was guilty. If a defendant makes an attempt to conceal the crime, this can be taken as evidence that the defendant knew it was wrong. If Mullen was found legally insane, then he would be considered not guilty. Therefore, any actions Mullen took to hide what he did would be closely examined. Also at issue was the notion of diminished capacity. If Mullen did not understand the meaning of his actions, he could not be found guilty of first-degree murder. His defense knew that diminished capacity was crucial to prove, and constructed their case on Mullen's weird doctrines of dementia. Mullen sat in his jail cell and ceaselessly scribbled out his philosophies, convinced he could explain the grand design behind his killings. He wrote on Jonah, Einstein, and earthquakes. These delusional belief systems would support his case, but not for the reasons in which he hoped. These bizarre notes would provide important evidence for the defense in attempting to prove his insanity. While waiting for trial, Mullen came face to face with the other homicidal maniac who had been terrorizing Santa Cruz, Edmund Kemper. 
Both Mullen and Kemper viewed their own killing rampages as missions and thought the other was a heathen. Mullen said he killed to save the world from earthquakes and despised Kemper as a brutish sex maniac. In turn, Kemper said that Mullen was just a cold-blooded killer, killing everyone he saw for no good reason. Kemper thought he was the one with the social statement making a demonstration to the authorities of Santa Cruz by killing the young women society treasured the most. Kemper is well known for his mother issues. Mullen, on the other hand, was transfixed by his father. Killing a Catholic father and a retired war veteran might be considered displaced aggravation against his own parent. He insisted that his father, Martin William Mullen, was a mass murderer. I want his fingerprints to be taken and compared with all murders which occurred in California and Oregon since 1925, he demanded. In addition to being responsible for all murders on the West Coast since the 20s, Herb also believed that his father telepathically ordered Dean Richardson to commit suicide by crashing his car in 1965. Herb Mullen's trial began July 30, 1973, and the formal plea had been entered as not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. Make no mistake, Mr. Mullen hears voices, and the voices told him to kill, said defense attorney James Jackson. These were not acts of murder, but acts of sacrifice. Jackson focused on Mullen's bizarre behavior before the murder spree. Mullen thought he was a Mexican laborer, columnist Herb Cain, and an Eastern philosopher. Jackson then dramatically introduced his client's killjoy sadism conspiracy theory. Everyone in Mullen's life was out to destroy his chances for happiness, both in this life and the next. He had to kill them. The courtroom fixated their attention on the scowling, dark-haired Mullen as he rocked back and forth slowly in his chair. He showed little emotion through the course of the trial, staring straight ahead at the wall when witnesses testified. Mullen was annoyed that his defense was intent on proving insanity. He couldn't wait to get on the stand himself and tell them the truth of why he killed. The prosecution was brief. Bob Francis testified on Mullen's voracious consumption of LSD. Weirdly, Mullen nodded his head in agreement as Francis talked, as if it proved the necessity to kill Genera. Joan Genera's mother recalled finding the young married couple shot to death in the bathroom. Ballistics experts and medical examiners portrayed for the jury the extent of Mullen's violent overkill while Mullen hunched over, taking extensive notes. On August 4th, psychiatrist Donald Lund testified on behalf of the defense to Mullen's clinical diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. He told me, Lund would later say, that if I would prepare a chronology of the world's wars and famines, and compare it with a list of major earthquakes throughout history, I would see that when the death rate goes up, the number of earthquakes goes down. Mullen believed that the duty of sacrificing yourself or others for the sake of the community was best demonstrated by his interpretation of Jonah. Mullen said, I mean, you read in the Bible about Jonah. There was twelve men in the boat. Jonah was in the boat. It was just like Jesus, you know? And Jonah stood up and said, God darn, if someone doesn't die, you know all thirteen of us are going to die. And he jumped overboard, and he was drowned. And the sea, about in a half hour or so, it calmed down. When Dr. Lund told Mullen that Jonah was pushed and didn't die after all because he was spit up by the whale, Mullen responded defensively, I'm asking you to swallow this Jonah story and believe that a minor natural disaster will prevent a major natural disaster. The question arose whether Mullen came up with the killing to stop earthquakes theory before or after he was caught. Dr. Donald Lund said that Mullen devised this theory years earlier, citing Mullen's letters written to the UN and other organizations, requesting statistics on yearly death tolls and natural disasters. Among his personal notes were disjointed theories on the phenomenon. Because Mullen was born on April 18th, the anniversary of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, he believed he had a privileged position among his generation to save it from future earthquakes. Einstein died on April 18th, which proved to Mullen that Einstein sacrificed himself so that Mullen would not have to be killed in Vietnam, but could save the coast from earthquakes instead. On the stand in his own defense, Mullen was described by one reporter as striking a lecturer's pose. He stood in the witness box with his many notes and blamed his family, friends, and teachers who wanted to keep him from becoming too powerful in the next life. Reincarnation wasn't just a cosmic ponderance. For Mullen, it explained everything. Everyone was bargaining for power and position in the next life. I am chosen as a designated leader of my generation, he said. This birthday also gives me an extremely dominant position in the reincarnation. He believed that his parents told him that they were going to give me a good time in the next life, but they couldn't this time. One man consenting to be murdered protects the millions of other human beings living in the cataclysmic earthquake tidal area. 
For this reason, the designated hero or leader and associates have the responsibilities of getting enough people to commit suicide and or consent to being murdered every day, Herb Mullen explained to the jury. As far as his victims go, Mullen said, I never thought about them. I wasn't thinking. I don't think. I was reacting. He claimed his victims consented to die, in fact were willing to die, and told him so by psychic transmissions. Every homo sapien communicates by mental telepathy. It's just not accepted socially, he said. He then went on to blame his father, and asked that he be removed from the courtroom before he continued his testimony, but the judge refused. However, the elder Mullen was moved so that his son wouldn't have to look at him. He also blamed the Santa Cruz police for not keeping him incarcerated after he was arrested for drug possession. I never would have killed anyone if they sent me to jail, he said. If they don't punish you for breaking the law, what were they doing? Waiting until I broke a big law so they could put me in prison for all of my life? Mullen admitted that he could, and did, disobey the voices telling him to kill. He had received telepathic commands to commit suicide, but refused. If he was the victim of irresistible voices, he would have killed himself, said Prosecutor Chris Cottle. Mullen said that he ignored the messages to kill. I received a message in December I did not act on. I just didn't want to kill anymore. I just didn't think it was right. This last statement was crucial to the prosecution's case against Mullen. He was admitting he knew the difference between right and wrong. He was not his father's robot, powerless to disobey, as he had previously said. He was capable of selectively obeying his father's messages to kill. When he heard his father tell him to kill his uncle Enos, Mullen refused. And the voice then suggested an alternative victim. For all the fearful wrath Mullen associated with these telepathic commands, they were surprisingly reasonable and willing to negotiate. Next, the prosecution tried to assert that if Mullen was legally insane and did not comprehend what he was doing, then why did he take such careful measures to cover his tracks? Assistant DA Chris Cottle told the jury that after killing White, he sandpapered the bloodstains off of the baseball bat. He picked up the shell casings at the Janera's house. Mullen shot Francis and her kids because they were witnesses and he ground off the serial number on his 22 caliber gun. While the prosecutor presented his case, Mullen, who usually avoided looking at anyone in the court, glared at Cottle. But Mullen had already undermined his case with reckless comments. In an earlier interview, Mullen said that he killed Joan Genera because she was a witness and I didn't want to be punished. The earthquake theory was developed as an afterthought, according to one court-appointed psychiatrist who examined Mullen. He killed Genera for getting him into drugs, and Joan, Kathy, Damon, and David because they were witnesses. He killed the campers because he had a thing about hippies, and he described them as hippies. Another court-appointed psychiatrist said that his motivation was pure hatred. He told me John Genera introduced him to LSD, and that ruined his life, and he took revenge. In a strange split, Dr. Charles Morris testified that after examining Mullen, he concluded that he was legally insane when he murdered the transient, the hitchhiker, and the priest, but legally sane during the last 10 murders. In January, when he quit doing LSD in hopes of becoming a Marine, Mullen killed out of revenge. He had been made morally numb by killing his first three victims, so that killing again, especially out of anger, no longer carried moral consequences. Perez was shot, he argued, because Mullen was tired and wanted to get caught. Dr. Morris contended that it was probably LSD that precipitated the murders. In response, defense attorney Jackson read a note from Mullen and asked the doctor if the rambling was written by someone on drugs. The doctor acknowledged that it was possible. The note was dated July 1973, months after Mullen had been incarcerated. It was a complaint written to the judge by Mullen regarding court procedure. Mullen's claim that he heard the victims telepathically agree to be killed, said Dr. Morris, was a concocted rationalization. He developed this belief as an afterthought, he said, and wasn't surprised by Mullen's cosmic sacrificial excuses. He's an individual with a high mental capacity and an interest in the occult, psychology, and philosophy. One doctor testified that Mullen told him, I chose to be vindictive because these people caused me to be an objector in the greatest country on earth, so I punished them. There was no question that Mullen was mentally ill. To prove the legal definition of insanity, the defense had to demonstrate that Mullen did not know the difference between right and wrong at the time of the murders. The prosecution told the jury that it did not matter why Mullen killed, motives are ambiguous and not necessary to prove. In countering the defense's theory that Mullen's delusions made him kill, the prosecution said, simply because 2 plus 2 equals 7 in his mind does not mean Mr. Mullen is not responsible for his actions. In closing, the defense asked the jury to consider the fact that Mullen kills people because he has to, but he doesn't know why. I suggest that a person who kills 13 people and doesn't know why is mad. The prosecution told the jury, there's no question he's mentally ill, seriously mentally ill. But that does not mean he's legally insane. He hid his crimes and even ground down the serial numbers on his gun. 
The six-man, six-woman jury deliberated for over 14 hours before finding Mullen both sane and guilty. The verdict was delivered on August 19, 1973. Mullen premeditated the deaths of Jim Genera and Kathy Francis, thereby making two counts of first-degree murder. The rest were considered impulse by the jury, therefore second-degree murder. It's as insane as Mullen is, said his defense attorney Jackson. They were afraid because he might get out and kill somebody, which is not an illogical consideration. They didn't want his 14th victim to be one of them. The prosecution was disappointed with only two counts of first-degree murder. Mullen only shrugged when he heard his verdict. Mullen was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2025. But Mullen's case didn't sit right with the jury foreman. He soon took action. After the trial, the jury foreman wrote that the California governor, Ronald Reagan, was as responsible as Mullen for the deaths of these 13 people. Reagan's administration had been systematically closing down California's mental hospitals with the plan to deactivate all of them within a few years. None of these deaths need ever have happened, he declared in an open letter to Reagan. Although the jury had believed that Mullen could tell the difference between right and wrong and therefore sane, they were also convinced that Mullen should have been institutionalized after being repeatedly diagnosed as dangerous. Five times prior to Mr. Mullen's arrest, he was entered into mental hospitals, and five times his illness was diagnosed. At least twice it was determined his illness could cause danger to the lives of human beings. Yet, in January and February of this year, he was free to take the lives of Santa Cruz residents. Reagan responded that it was a psychiatric mistake and the state was not dumping out on the street the previously hospitalized mentally ill. Mullen had been committed to five different mental hospitals but always released despite the lack of his prognosis. Alarmed by his deteriorating sanity, his parents desperately tried to find a hospital for long-term care, but mental hospitals were rapidly closing. Although he received prescriptions and sporadically attended group therapy, without supervision he was incapable of taking his medication regularly. Even in a hospital setting, when he was closely monitored, he was still aggressive and violent. He was dangerous and should have been kept off the streets. Within a year after the Mullen trial, California legislators passed a bill to prohibit the closure of any other mental hospitals. Herb Mullen did not kill because he was a schizophrenic, but for him, his bizarre paranoia and twisted self-importance justified his murders. After all, in his mind, he was saving California from earthquakes. His life mission was to be his generation's scapegoat but it was the others who would have to sacrifice their lives. After the trial, Mullen was incarcerated at Mule Creek State Prison in Ione, California, and had since applied and been denied parole eight times from 1980 on. On August 18, 2022, Mullen died at age 75 from natural causes while housed at the California Healthcare Facility, a state prison for incarcerated patients with long-term medical needs or acute mental health needs, located in Stockton, California. Whether it was the drugs, schizophrenia, insanity, other influences, or a combination thereof, which drove Herbert Millen to kill, he was finally taken off of the streets where he could no longer harm the public. However, this is just one of the many deranged murderers to have terrorized us in the past, and those currently operating right now. Be sure to like and subscribe for more insane true stories. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you on the next one.